Good morning. I would like to talk about the Dominican contributions to the evangelization of the Philippines during the past 500 years. Before they came to the Philippines, the Spanish Dominican missionaries had already worked for many years in Latin America. They arrived there in 1510. They first worked in the island called La Hispaniola, which is now divided into two nations, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. They also worked extensively in Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Chile, and Venezuela, where they achieved the distinction of being the champions of human rights of the natives. Among the well-known Dominicans during this time were Bartolomé de las Casas, whom the Spanish government granted the official title of Protector of the Indios for courageously denouncing the abuses of Spanish colonizers against the natives, and also Antonio de Montesinos, who was the first Dominican to preach against the enslavement and harsh treatments of the natives of Latin America. Both of them were actually students, followers of Francisco de Victoria, who, although he never set foot in Latin America, wrote extensively about the concept of the law of the nations, in Latin, jus gentium, which emphasized the intrinsic dignity of every man, a dignity that cannot be violated by Spain's policies in the colonies. His writings became one of the sources of what is now called international law. As expected, the advocacy of the Dominicans in favor of the natives generated much ill will and even hatred from their fellow Spaniards. Many of them were persecuted, killed, or sent back to Spain. Despite these trials, however, they continued to work in Latin America and were successful in their work of evangelization, in building churches and schools, and in their work of uplifting the cultural and political status of the natives. You know, it was not easy to be a missionary during those times. It demanded great stamina and courage. If you have time, I invite you to watch a movie called The Mission, featuring the famous actors Robert De Niro and Jeremy Irons. Missionaries during those times had to cross oceans, walk through expanses of deserts and jungles, and climb mountains and fight of fierce tribes of natives. They also had to contend with wild animals and other dangerous creatures. They had to endure the bites of mosquitoes and other insects. They had to withstand heavy rains, storms, floods, earthquakes, and other calamities. Usually, they had to start from nothing. They just had to rely on the kindness of natives and the grace of God as they strive to Christianize the natives, built roads, highways, bridges, churches, chapels, convents, and schools. After working for several years in Latin America, the Spanish Dominicans set their eyes uh, to evangelize countries in Southeast Asia. Although their interest was focused only on China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. On April 18, 1587, 15 Dominicans left Acapulco in Mexico and embarked in a galleon named Ship of China for their journey to the Philippines. After three months, they reached the shores of Cavite on July 22, 1587, the Feast of St. Mary Magdalene. This proved providential because until today, Dominicans consider Mary Magdalene as one of their patron saints. Well, it's not because we are sinners, but because as the first person to witness and announce the resurrection of Jesus, 
the Dominicans venerate Mary Magdalene as the model of all preachers. From Cavite, they walked towards Manila, which they reached after three days on July 25, 1587, feast day of St. James. They were welcomed by the first bishop appointed for the islands, the Dominican Domingo de Salazar, who arrived together with the Jesuits in the Philippines six years earlier in 1581 as the first bishop of Manila. In January 1588, the Dominicans started to build their first Dominican convent and in a marshy and mosquito-infested place in Intramuros, the walled city of Manila. They named it Santo Domingo Convent in honor of St. Dominic de Guzman, the founder of the Order of Preachers. The Convento de Santo Domingo would become and remains until now the center of Dominican life and focal point of their intellectual and missionary apostolate. For centuries, it was located inside Intramuros, but it was destroyed during the Second World War. And a new Santo Domingo church was built in Quezon City in 1954 and continues up to now to serve as the mother house of all Dominicans in the country and the house of formation of our major seminarians. The Dominicans thus initiated their presence, a missionary and evangelical presence that continues for more than 500 years. They have been dynamic and living agents of Christianization and evangelization of the Filipino people. Their missions were first established in Cavite and Laguna and in Manila. In Manila, their first mission station was the one in Binondo for the Chinese residing there. They accepted this mission in 1596 and they looked at this mission as a way to prepare them for their eventual departure for China. You know, since their arrival in the Philippines, many Dominicans considered the Philippines as merely a springboard to China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. It was only when they realized that those countries had prohibited the entrance of missionaries that they finally gave up their desire to go there and dedicated themselves fully to the task of Christianizing the Philippines. So what were their fields of apostolate or missionary activities during the Spanish regime? The Dominicans worked very hard to evangelize the provinces of Pangasinan, Bataan, and Cagayan. The churches, parishes, and towns that they had built there continue to exist until now. In Pangasinan, they founded the towns and parishes of Santo Domingo Binalatongan, now San Carlos City, Calasiao, Mangaldan, and Manawa which is a center of pilgrimage today, and other towns in northern Tarlac, which was then a part of Pangasinan. In Bataan, they founded and developed the towns of Santo Domingo de Abukay, Samal, Orani, Balanga, Pilar, Orion, and Hermosa. The Dominicans also devoted much time and effort to evangelize the whole of Cagayan Valley, a region inhabited by numerous and different native tribes. Here, they not only built towns and parishes, but also roads that are still used until today. They also endeavored to evangelize the fierce tribes of the Apayaos, Kalingas, Bontok, and Ifugaos of the mountain province. The Dominicans went to the northernmost tip of the Philippines, to evangelize the people of the Batanes and Babuyanes Islands. In summary, during the first 100 years of the Dominicans in the Philippines, 601 Spanish Dominicans came and worked in the country. From their arrival in 1587 up to the end of the Spanish regime, there were more than 
2,500 Dominican missionaries and 100 Dominican bishops who worked in the country and in other Asian countries. Many Dominican missionaries are now declared by the Church as martyrs and saints for having died while preaching the faith in Japan, China, Korea, and Vietnam. After the Philippine Revolution of 1898, many of the churches and ministries that the Dominicans established were all transferred to the secular clergy. The Dominican presence in the country then became focused in Manila, primarily in Santo Domingo Convent and Church, the University of Santo Tomas, and the Colegio de San Juan de Letran. Fortunately, in 1900s, the local inhabitants of the Batanes Island, including Camigin and Kaulayan, as well as in some towns in Pangasinan, like Manawag, Dagupan, and Lingayen, clamored for the return of the Dominicans in those places. Now, one hour is not enough to enumerate everything that the Dominicans have contributed to the Philippine Church and society for the past 500 years. A good way to encapsulate such contribution is the concept Simbahayan, which stands for Simbahan, Church, Bayan, Nation, Tahanan, Family, Simbahayan. Simbahayan became one of the slogans or hashtags popularized by the University of Santo Tomas during its quadricentennial celebration. Simbahayan comprehends what the Dominicans, especially the University of Santo Tomas, had done for the Philippine Church, for the Filipino nation, and for the Filipino family. Simbahayan, the Dominican way, is an eloquent reminder of what the Dominicans have done and continue doing for the church and the country. It also renews and intensifies the Dominican's commitment to pursue its various advocacies. So in the building up of the Philippine church, the, contribu the Dominicans contributed a lot. Not only did they establish churches, parishes, towns, roads, bridges, and schools, not only did they evangelize the Filipinos, but they also provided the beans so that the Philippine Church could subsist and develop on its own. The Dominicans established the first seminary college for future priests in the country. This seminary college eventually became the University of Santo Tomas. From this university emerged the pioneer Filipino secular priests who led the establishment of a truly indigenous church composed and led by Filipinos themselves. In 1928, the Sacred Congregation for Seminaries in the Vatican established in the University of Santo Tomas an interdiocesan seminary for secular priests. Seminarians from various dioceses were sent by their bishops to the university in order to be formed. And when we say formation, which is Dominican, specifically Dominican, it means not only pastoral formation of priests, but also their intellectual and doctrinal formation. This sets the UST Interdiocesan Seminary apart from other seminaries. Seminarians here must obtain ecclesiastical degrees in philo either in philosophy, theology, or canon law. These. From this seminary have emerged thousands of priests, not only in the Philippines, but also from neighboring Asian countries. Almost one half of the total number of bishops in the Philippines today are products of the interdiocesan seminary of the University of Santo Tomas. The Dominicans learned from their experience in Latin America that it is not good to apply a tabula rasa or clean slate approach in evangelization. So as much as possible, they maintained and nourished popular ways 
by which the natives expressed their faith in God, but at the same time trying to purify these of their non-Christian elements or perfecting these to serve as authentic ways of worship. The Dominicans propagated the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary through the introduction of the praying of the Rosary, not only as a private devotion, but as a public and communal form of prayer. Two well-loved shrines of the Blessed Virgin were established and maintained until today by Dominicans. The Shrine of Our Lady of Manawag, which attracts millions of devotees every year, and the Shrine of Our Lady of the Rosary of La Naval, which is visited by devotees of Mary, especially during the month of the Rosary, October, featuring a nine-day novena, culminating in a grand procession, which one of our national artists, the late Nick Joaquin, declared, described as the procession of all processions because of its solemnity and grandeur. The Dominicans were also at the forefront of the struggle against dangerous Western influences characterized by ultra-liberalism in morality and skepticism towards or outright denial of the truth of our faith. They emphasized adherence to the Catholic doctrine and unchanging Catholic moral principles that govern our conduct and behavior. This conservatism is perhaps one of the reasons why the revolutionaries, mostly influenced by the liberal movements in Spain, became anti-Dominicans. During the revolution of 1898, there were 115 Dominican missionaries who were forcibly captured and imprisoned for several months. They were flogged, starved, tortured, and some were even killed. The Dominicans who came to the Philippines were products of the Counter-Reformation in Europe. Not only did they tirelessly preach the authentic Catholic faith, but also tried to preserve its purity. So they took seriously the work of catechizing the natives to the extent that they had to learn the native languages in order to translate Catholic doctrines and teachings in these languages. They established schools, colleges, and universities. The most well-known are the University of Santo Tomas and the Coleo de San Juan de Letran and the Aquinas University, now renamed University of Santo Tomas Legaspi. The Dominicans introduced the Filipinos to Spanish culture, but at the same time did not completely Hispanize them. They allowed the Filipinos to maintain and develop important aspects of their native culture, like language, Filipino values and norms of conduct, family togetherness, and others. Although Filipinos today were, are now writing with a Western script, only the Dominicans preserved Dominican uh, documents that show the ancient script of the Filipino natives called the Baybayin. You can find this in the archives of the University of Santo Tomas. The Dominicans established the first printing press in 1593 in the country, and it published the first three books ever printed in the Philippines. These are Doctrina Christiana, a catechism written in Spanish and Tagalog, another Doctrina Christiana written in Chinese, and the Shilu, or Apology for the True Religion, written in Chinese. For many centuries now, the Dominican printing press has contributed to the country's intellectual and cultural progress by consistently producing publications that mirror the university's goal to promote dialogue by integrating knowledge about man, nature, and God. Lately, the UST Press has been renamed UST Publishing House to make it more up-to-date with the times. It has won Publisher of the Year in 2003 and 2004 
and in 2011 and 2013 from the prestigious Manila Critics Circle. Many of its titles have won National Book Awards, the Gintong Aklat Award, and several equally prestigious accolades from various organizations, a testimony of its reputation as one of the country's premier publishing houses. In many ways, the Dominicans enriched Filipino culture by developing native talents and abilities. Perhaps only the Dominicans can boast of having produced many national artists in the field of music, visual arts, architecture, and literature. The oldest museum in the Philippines, the USD Museum, established by the Dominicans, and which despite two world wars and unexpected calamities, is able to preserve not only cultural and historical artifacts found in the Philippines and in Asia, but also natural artifacts that prove beneficial to the study of natural science, archaeology, and ethnography. The Dominicans also are unique in the sense that they maintain the USD archives, the oldest and perhaps one of the existing archives in Asia that boasts of an exhaustive collection of Western or European documents, books, manuscripts, microfilms, and other historical records about various fields of human endeavor. The USD archives is one of the few places in the country that is dedicated to the restoration of rare books. These are later microfilmed after their restoration and made available for researchers all over the world through the internet. Now perhaps the biggest library in the Philippines is the USD library. It can sit around 800 students at a time and boasts of a collection of more than 500,000 books, journals, and magazines, and around 30,000 rare books from the 15th century to the 19th century. One of its most precious rare books is the original of the Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, or On the Revolution of the Celestial Spheres, a book written by Nikolai Copernicus, printed in 1543, which changed our idea of the solar system. Another unique contribution of the Dominicans in the field of culture is the continuing cultural heritage studies. Students and teachers of this program go around the country documenting historical cultural sites and heritage architecture and proposing programs to conserve these. It also holds conferences on church heritage and publishes this in its journal. As regards nation building, what I can say is almost all of the heroes that led the independence of the Philippines from Spain in order to come up with an independent nation are products of the Dominicans. More prominent among them are Jose Rizal, the first martyrs of nationalism, Jose Burgos, Mariano Gomez, and Jacinto Zamora, famously known as Gombursa, Emilio Jacinto, Apolinario Mabini, Antonio Luna, Juan Luna, Marcelo del Pilar, Gregorio Aglipay, Epifanio de los Santos, and many others. Of the 16th presidents of the Philippines, four were products of the Dominicans, the better ones. Manuel Luis Quezon, Sergio Osmeña, Jose Laurel, and Diosdado Macapagal. The Dominicans have produced three vice presidents, seven chief justices of the Supreme Court, hundreds of congressmen and senators who are still working. Many of them, many of them are still working until now. Sixty-three delegates of the First Constitutional Assembly that firm framed the first ever constitution of the country were products of the University of Santo Tomas. Delegates of the First Philippine Assembly of 1907, Constitutional Assembly of 1934, and the Constitutional Assembly of 1972 count among them graduates of the universities or colleges run by Dominicans. 
The Dominicans also pioneered the teaching of various academic disciplines that led to the birth and development of various professions and industries in the country. Before any, other, before any school or professional school or technical school was established in the country, the Dominicans already had the Faculty of Theology and Philosophy as early as 1611, the Faculty of Civil Law in 1734, the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in 1871, the Faculty of Pharmacy in 1871 also, the School of Notaries in 1875, the School of Midwifery in 1879, the first time that women were allowed to enroll in USD, the College of Nursing in 1879, the Faculty of Arts and Letters in 1896, the Faculty of Engineering in 1907, the College of Education in 1926, the College of Science in 1926, the Institute of Physical Education and Athletics 1929, the College of Architecture in 1930, and the College of Commerce and Business Administration in 1933. The graduate school was established in 1938 and the Conservatory of Music in 1946. The latest addition to its roster of colleges are the College of Fine Arts and Design, the College of Accountancy, and the College of Tourism and Hospitality Management. Although seldom acknowledged as a great Dominican contribution to the country and church, the University of Santo Tomas Hospital is an eloquent proof of the consistent but unassuming service that the Dominicans render to the nations. Today, the clinical division of the hospital is the biggest private charity hospital in the country. Aside from the number of indigent patients admitted daily who fill up almost every bed and ward available, around 500 free consultations are done in the outpatient department. A sample statistics from 2008 to 2011, a total of 575,583 patients benefited from the hospital's free medical services. The pay division of the hospital is being maintained by the Dominicans in order to subsidize the clinical division to the tune of around 100 million pesos annually. People continue to flock to the USD hospital because of the excellent medical service rendered by the physicians and other health workers who are products of the USD Faculty of Medicine and Surgery and the colleges of, for health allied so, sciences like the USD College of Nursing, Physical Therapy, Pharmacy, Medical Technology, and others. Physicians and health workers who are products of the Dominicans are well known all over the world for their expertise, skills, but most of all, for their compassion and Christian values. The Dominican missionaries who came to the Philippines gave a high premium on education, having been themselves products of the counter or the Catholic Reformation. In fact, the Dominican presence in the country has been identified with the molding of the youth in our society according to Christian principles and values. That is why the most palpable influence that the Dominicans have in this country and its greatest contribution to evangelization is through education. Together with the Dominican sisters and the Dominican lay tertiaries, the Dominicans have established and administered schools that have consistently offered Filipinos quality Catholic education. The history of the education in the country shows that up to 1863, education was entirely in the hands of the clergy. In 1863, this changed with the royal decree from Queen Isabel II, which established the normal school for men and later the Normal School for Women in 1871, which formed teachers who will be responsible for primary and elementary education. According to statistics, 
From 1865 to 1896, the normal school for men graduated a total of 2,137 male teachers. In the educational apostolate, two Dominican schools figured prominently in history. One is the Colegio de San Juan de Letran, which celebrates this year its 400th anniversary of foundation. It was originally established for Spanish orphans, but later it opened its doors to others, first to those born of Spanish parents, and later in the 19th century to other students, whether native or Chinese mestizos. From these schools came the leaders and role models in our society who set the direction of our nation during the critical periods in history when Filipinos struggled for independence and national sovereignty. Perhaps the educational institution that has the most far-reaching influence, both historically and geographically, is the University of Santo Tomas. Its humble beginnings really prove that when God wills something, He will see to its successful completion. The university was founded by the Dominican Bishop Miguel de Benavides, who, like his confrere and predecessor, Domingo de Salazar, first bishop of Manila, also preached and wrote against the violations of human rights committed by Spanish authorities and settlers against the native Filipinos. Two days before his death, on July 26, 1605, he was only 55 years old when he died. He donated the little savings that he had, amounting to 1,500 pesos, as seed money for the establishment of the university. He also donated his collection of books. The first school building of the Coleo was located across Santo Domingo Church in Intramuros. It took six years, however, in 1611 before the Foundation Act was formally prepared and signed by the Dominican authorities in the country. The school was first called Coleo de, San de Nuestra Señora del Rosario and was open to all who wished to pursue the study of arts and theology. But since the school's first statutes were based on those of the universities of Salamanca and Mexico, all enrollees admitted were pure Spaniards, and they had to demonstrate the purity of their Spanish blood, called limpieza de sangre, before they are admitted. The school started graduating degrees in philosophy and theology in 1619. In 1645, the Coleo de Nuestra Señora del Rosario became a university through a decree of Pope Innocent X, and it became Universid Universidad de Santo Tomas, University of St. Thomas Aquinas. During the time, it was allowed that enrol enrolled students would reside inside the university for free. The quality of teaching in the university may be exemplified by the textbooks authored by Safarino Gonzalez, a brilliant Dominican professor at the UST in the 1850s. His works were published both in Manila and in Madrid, and Gonzalez was ev eventually made a cardinal. His books and other writings, many of which he wrote while he was in UST, led to the revival of the study of the works of St. Thomas Aquinas in Europe and in the, mid in the middle of the 19th century. Students in the university paid very minimal tuition fees, and many enjoyed scholarship given by the university to deserving students. The Dominicans also maintained the operation of the university for three centuries, you might be surprised at this, without any financial subsidy from the Spanish government although it was granted the title Royal University, but this title was given with the provision that it shall not receive or should not ask any financial subsidy from the royal coffers. The university therefore was supported only by 
donations from concerned citizens and also from the earnings by the Dominicans from lands that they acquired throughout the 17th to the 19th centuries. They used the earnings from these lands to finance the expenses of the university. So in the beginning, these lands were idle, but they were developed into haciendas, also known as friar lands, as the anti-clerical literature would call them. Unknown to many, the income generated from these friar lands were used extensively for the University of Santo Tomas, the Cule de San Juan de Letran, and the Dominican Missionary Apostolate in the Philippines, Japan, China, Taiwan, and Vietnam as well. As mentioned earlier, the university was established following the statutes of Dominican universities in Spain and Mexico. So these statutes strictly prohibited the admission of non-Spaniard. It appeared, however, that despite this, the Dominicans also admitted a few Chinese mestizos, but only by way of exception. Because of the scarcity of archival records, it is difficult to ascertain how many non-Spanish Dominicans were admitted to USD in the first two centuries of existence. However, even if there were no native students yet in the university, there were already students, native students from China and Vietnam who were given scholarship by the Spanish government. Now what we can be sure of is the fact that as late as 1773, there was still no policy of admitting natives to the university. If ever there were some Chinese mestizos admitted, it was by way of exception and marked by a lot of controversy. It was only in the middle of the 19th century that the university adopted a policy of accepting native students, although with great caution and great selectivity. Proof to this is the fact that as late as 1895, the tribunal for determining the purity of Spanish blood of those who wish to enroll in the in the university still exists or still existed and one of its directors was in fact Jose Burgos. In 1865, as mentioned earlier, Queen Isabella issued a decree creating a much needed system of secondary education in the Philippines. By this decree, the University of Santo Tomas was appointed to serve as a sort of National Department of Education and the rector of the university became the Minister of Education in the country. Thus, the university was entrusted with the inspection of all high schools in the Philippines. It was also responsible for maintaining standards, confirming grades, and conferring degrees in those schools. The stringent process of admission and the high standard of selectivity allowed the university to maintain its high standard of instructions. Students must have been given excellent education, considering that the leaders who began the propaganda movement in 1870s or spawned the revolution in 1896, which led to the formation of a Philippine Republic independent of Spain in 1898, were graduates of the University of Santo Tomas. Consider this too. Almost two-thirds of the signatories of the Constitution promulgated in 1899 graduated from the University. This is a clear manifestation of the level of political, cultural, and economic maturity that the University has bequeathed to the Filipinos. Today, the university students from the, of the university come from 71 provinces in the Philippines and from all its 59 cities, not to mention the other 33 countries as well. Its current enrollment of about 40,000 students comprise approximately a quarter of the total Catholic school population, tertiary population in the country. The university produces an average of 7,000 graduates every year, 
which constitutes roughly 15% of the total number of college graduates in the Philippines annually. The university has more than 2,000 faculty members and a support group of employees numbering almost 1,000. So judging from the annual number of USD graduates, one can say that quantitatively, the university contributes a lot to human resource development in the country. One way to determine the quality of this contribution is the performance of its graduates in national examinations given by the government for secondary and tertiary schools. It consistently tops or has the highest number of passers in board examinations for physicians, nurses, medical technologies, pharmacies, teachers, physical therapists, architects, engineers, accountants, and others. The USD alumni include many of the illustrious men and women who shaped and are shaping the destiny of the Philippine society. The list includes priests and members of the Catholic Church hierarchy, as I've mentioned earlier, four presidents of the Philippines, six justices of the Supreme Court, elected and appointed government officials, presidents and executives of top Philippine business corporations, founders of, and presidents of other colleges and universities, statesmen, diplomats, and countless teachers who are now the staff of other Philippine and foreign universities and colleges. Worth mentioning too are the alumni who are now hailed as national heroes because of their participation in the Philippine Revolution. And also the canonized saints who because of their martyrdom in the 17th and 19th century and even 20th century were before faculty members and students of the university are now declared saints. Today, the statistics of the various Dominican colleges and universities in the country show that the influence of Dominicans on education is a force to reckon with. One editor of a, of a newspaper, Jose Lito Sulueta, alluded to such an influence when he declared, so ubiquitous and evenly spread are the Dominican schools in the country that their number comprise comprises a veritable education department itself. In 1995, the Dominican schools in the country bonded together to form an organization called DOMNET, or Network of Dominican Schools, Colleges, and University. During its launching, there were around 100,000 students in all Dominican schools, 3,500 faculty members, 2,500 non-academic employees, 1,100 administrators, producing around 10,000 college graduates every year, many of whom top the professional board examinations. The university being Catholic shows its preferential option for the poor. Relatively, the tuition fees collected from students are way below the collect those collected by schools considered as elitist schools. And yet, despite this, it continues to maintain quality education as attested to by the fact that many of its course offerings are now recognized by the Commission on Higher Education as centers of excellence. The university is also committed to help the poor through various community service programs. These programs serve not only as means to extend help to marginalized communities, but also as a way to prepare young students to become professionals imbued with the spirit of compassion, commitment, and genuine service to others. I have already mentioned the charity programs extended to the poor every day by the clinical divisions of the USD hospital. Recently, the USD hospital launched a project called ARC, ARC or acts of random kindness. And because of this, the hospital was awarded twice consecutively as the best hospital in Asia for corporate social responsibility by Healthcare Asia Awards, which is based in Singapore. 
I have also mentioned earlier the USD Simbahayan. The Dominican province of the Philippines has also an equivalent outreach program organized and implemented by its Commission for Justice and Peace. In 2011, the Simbahayan organized and funded a total of 862 projects. These projects were delivered to their beneficiaries a total number of, by a total number of 596 volunteers composed of faculty members, student leaders, administrators, support staff, and alumni. These projects comprehend five uh, outreach programs. The first is Program for Karunungan or Knowledge uh, Sharing or Extension, Kanlungan, Shelter, Kabuhayan, Livelihood, Kalusugan, Health, and Kapayapaan or Peace Education for those people who are divided by conflicts, especially because of poverty and because of uh, poverty and political and other political conflicts. In order to perhaps uh, simplify these outreach programs and its effect on its beneficiaries, programs made by the university, I would like to share with you what one ITA leader expressed during one faculty convocation in the university. This ITA leader is from Tarlac, one of, our, one of the places where the university had its uh, outreach program for Karunungan and also for Kabuhayan, Kalusugan, and Kanlungan. And uh, the ITA leader during the convocation stood up, took the stage and the microphone and said, before the university people came to our place, we were exploited by many people, especially by politicians, because we didn't know how to read. Gradually, we started losing our lands to them because they just wanted us to sign things or documents which we cannot read. So what they did was just to put our fingerprints on the documents. But when the university people came to help us and made us literate, these people who were exploiting us they stopped doing it. They started to respect us. They started to stop, or rather they stopped doing all those manipulative activities that, they, that for many years they conducted among us. And so now, he shouted before the faculty members, students, administrators gathered in that convoca convocation. And so now, I am very proud to say, I am, sabi niya sa Pilipino, ako ay Aitang Pilipino, Aitang Tumasino. Thank you very much.